Hello. Welcome, everybody. So glad you could join us for DataFest. I am Elena Eneva. I am the Data Lab Director this summer. Um, we have you guys here in the audience. We're also streaming this, so we have some um, people on Zoom. And warm welcome to our virtual um, guests as well. Um, this event is going to have two parts. This is the first part where we talk to you and we do our lightning talks. And the second part is going to be in about an hour where all, hopefully all of you guys here will walk over with us to uh, the library for a poster session, an interactive demonstration session, and a reception. So we have some great stuff set up for you today, and we're excited to get started. Today, we have the honor of having Stellani's uh, Vice Chancellor, Nancy Berner, with us. Uh, and uh, she will say a few words of introduction. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much. And thank you um, to the audience and hello, and hello to the virtual audience as well. Um, I am hosting um, an event at Chen Hall, um, sort of as we speak. Um, and so I'm sorry, I cannot stay for the talks this evening, but, um, uh, and I, I will be heading out right after this. Um, I went to the talks last year and I enjoyed them immensely. And I hear that these talks will be recorded and I will be uh, watching them later. But uh, I really enjoyed the, um, the talks last, uh, last year for sure. Um, and, but I am very happy to have the chance to be here for just uh, a, a couple of minutes. Um, as I said, I was at the Data Lab talks last year. And in following uh, the Data Lab last summer and this summer, I'm really proud of the work of our really remarkable staff, faculty, uh, alumni, and especially our students. Um, and, uh, and, and our partners from um, Purdue and the universities of Maryland and Pikeville. So thank you all for being with us this summer and for your commitment to making a difference. Data Lab is an exciting program for Sewanee because, first of all, of course, we need data and we need to use data. Secondly, data science aligns perfectly with our liberal arts curriculum. It's interdisciplinary. It requires critical thinking, good communication skills, and teamwork. It's complemented by the ethical and moral grounding that has brought all of you here in the pursuit of social good. And as future scientists, teachers, business leaders, lawyers, doctors, and community activists, I can't think of a more important field. You've gained industry valued skills and you are helping um, to address some of the challenges of the world today um, and, and uh, locally. Swanee has a long history of molding bright young minds, just like yours, of helping students with exceptional intellectual curiosity and, uh, and courageous spirit develop into extraordinary change makers. Change makers who stand out in the world beyond our gates as individuals of character, capacity, and consequence. And now, coupled with data science for the social good, we have high expectations of you, and we're confident that you will help to shape the world that you want to see and that you want to live in. I want to thank Jim Peterman, Eric Keene, Matthew Rudd, and Joe Brew for their work and dedication on the program, and a special thanks to uh, Elena Enova for moving her family across the country <laughs> to direct the program this summer. And to all of you data science fellows, thank you for your time and commitment to do something, to doing something bigger than yourselves. To the mentors and community partners, this work is not possible without your generosity and your spirit 
and, um, and time. Thank you. And thank you to New America for their generous financial support and to Raid Ghani for connecting us um, to this work. We look forward to taking these connections that were made this summer even further and, um, and growing the data science for social good movement among liberal arts institutions. We are proud to be the first, but we cannot be the last liberal arts institution to take up this charge. We look forward to continuing to support the work. And again, I can't thank each of you enough for your commitment to social good and for being here this, with us this summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, thank you, a big thank you to the university. It means a lot to us that we have the university's full support and commitment to continue growing Data Lab. And uh, we stay tuned for more great things in the future. Um, now, I would like to present to you our um, guest of honor, Karen Proctor. I think a lot of you here know Karen. She is a social innovation leader. She advises universities, organizations, individuals on how to, how to galvanize their resources to produce new creative um, ways of solving social problems of long-term uh, long solutions to social problems. So really the perfect speaker for us to have um, at Data Lab. She's joining us uh, virtually today from New Jersey. Uh, thank you, Karen, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? So I hope you all can hear me. Yes, can you clap if you can hear me? That way I'll know for sure. Uh, well, I wish I could be there with you in person, um, but I was there last week um, finishing up my summer in the School of Letters program and needed to come home after a busy Swanee um, month and a half and just needed to refresh myself before I come back to the mountain. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful that you're accommodating me virtually, um, but as you all know, this is the future is this sort of hybrid integrated thing. So I'm excited to be able to provide a few words um, to all of you. So first of all, I wanna say congratulations to the data scientists on finishing up your summer. So give yourselves another round of applause for your work. Like the vice chancellor, I just also want to express my gratitude for all the dedicated folks who have guided this program from inception to a second summer of supporting the work of geniuses from Purdue, the University of Maryland, the University of Pikeville, and the University of the South. I think what Data Lab demonstrates is that um, an idea a conversation, something that needs to happen can in fact happen when people work together, collaborate across disciplines, across institutions, and just say, this is important and we're gonna make it happen. And then put in the toil and the trials and the tribulations and deal with all of that to make the, the dream a reality. So you all are living out something that folks had in their minds a long, long time ago. Nikki Hamilton and Raheed a long time ago, Jim Peterman et al. Um, imagined this, and so now it is. So I have a couple of thoughts to share with all of you data scientists, as I consider the importance of what you've done this summer, um, but also what you've learned as part of this important initiative. And I warn you that my thoughts are shaped um, by me being an old woman who's done this work of social design for more than 35 years. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, I've been practicing this field of social design before it was even called that and have had some recent experiences though with my clients through uh, my social innovation firm, my side hustle, Harbor Workshop, that kind of are the key to, to what I'm gonna share with you. So, so first of all is the kudos. So kudos to you. 
I'm inspired by the fact that you de dedicated a good part of your summer of 2022 focused on gaining knowledge and skills around data science and, and what it all means. So that's something that you didn't have to do. You chose to do it and you chose to do it for all the variety of reasons represented by the variety of people that were data scientists at the data lab this summer. So you spent time learning and applying your learning so that you can become good at it and start developing an expertise around this thing called big data and what do we do with that? And you're answering that question by showing up and going through the data lab experience. Yesterday, I spent some time with colleagues from one of the top 50 companies in the United States. Uh, I was with a team within this huge organization that I won't name, um, who work on uh, what they call design strategy and transformation. And these are these folks represent designers of all kinds, engineers, social designers, experienced designers, futurists, and they're working to improve the products and services that the company puts out in the world. And they're also working to improve the industry by thinking about who the industry currently does not serve. And so central to their work is being able to ask questions, to be able to observe phenomenon, to prototype, to test ideas, being able to generate all of that useful data, to synthesize it, to make meaning of it for themselves, but also for others. And so regardless of what their group was that they worked with, the common thread across all their work was data and how to understand it and how to use it to make decisions that will point the company in the direction that they hope it would go. They're using their knowledge uh, to think forward about what needs to be addressed, not just for today's challenges, but for challenges in the future. So in effect, they all have some data scientists um, stuff in them. They're always gleaning the information that they're gathering to make informed decision about future directions. What was so impressive to me about this team is that they all know how to do something so fundamentally important to the problems that they're working to solve. This data science is not a special thing for them. It's not like, uh, oh, and, and I know how to do this. They all knew how to do this. They all were doing what you were doing this summer as a day-to-day -day part of their work, right? They know it, they're skilled in it, and I got a chance to witness how they applied it um, to the kinds of imaginative ideas that they have in terms of improving their company and improving the industry. And so as you've spent the summer getting these skills, and some of you had some skills already and you were practicing them and you're honing them, you're doing that in the context of an area that really cuts across all fields and is really a matter of fact way of working at this point in the, in the 21st century. So we, we need to keep that in mind. And yeah, it's a big company. So you say, well, why is she talking about that when we did social good and all the things? Um, because we need data scientists who knew, know how to use data science for social good in all domains, in, in business, uh, you know, in the business sector, in government, in the private sector, in the nonprofit sector, we, we need folks that have this capacity in every sector. Uh, in this company, there were social designers who are very, very focused on social causes. And so they're using their knowledge of data science and applying it, yes, to this company, but also looking for ways that they can get the company to address the challenges of historically underserved communities. And so we need more of that. And uh, perhaps um, some of you in there will be working at big companies and using all that you know to, to go find what that company, what that industry can do to advance social good um, at large scales. Because it's not just the nonprofit sector that does this. It's the for-profit sector, it's government, it's all sectors that we need to have the skills that you practiced this summer. So that's my first point. My second point has to do with a hope. And my hope is that as you learned about some of these issues that you worked on this summer, that you came to a realization that even with the best information, the best data, when it comes to addressing opportunities or solving problems, you really have to focus on the long game. 
So I've been a practicing social designer, as I mentioned, for more than 35 years. And I'm very concerned about the best ways to address complex social challenges. And I know in practice that we need all the resources that we can get to be able to both see the problem, which data does, but also to look for ways to address the problem and or opportunities, because that's the other piece of it. It's not just problems that we're solving, but it's looking in community for opportunities to leverage community strengths to be able to do something incredible. And data gives us that 360 perspective to be able to see an issue on all sides by, by pulling those insights out of the information that we get. We have a, a deeper perspective on what we're dealing with, but also on ways to solve it. But the reality is that it takes time, particularly when you consider some of the issues that you all were dealing with this summer, from healthcare to um, you know, predatory lending to what's happening environmentally with bats and uh, caves and, and all of that. These are long game kinds of issues that aren't going to be solved in a summer through a project or, or just through data alone. It takes a lot of collaboration. This past summer, um, I celebrated with a major U.S. foundation client of mine, the materialization of an initiative that we have been working on for 10 years. 10 years. It's a food security issue in Haiti that is getting worse, that has taken 10 years to bring all of these incredible, diverse, multi-sector partners together to create an initiative that is really targeted and has a good shot at sustainably dealing with food insecurity in Haiti um, for the long game. And my colleagues leading the data analysis around that work had to reimagine their approaches for the work because of the place, because of the culture, some of the skills and things that they had built up in um, other places like the United States and Canada and France had to be reimagined uh, because of what was on the ground in Haiti. And that took time and it took relationships and it took networks. And we had to continually learn and refine our skills to humbly collaborate with each other to get to a place of designing and implementing what I believe is one of the most promising initiatives that will happen in Haiti um, in a long time. So as part of that, yes, data and yes, data science and yes, all of what we did in data lab. But if we forget to be humble and we forget that this is a long game and we forget that this is about working with other people, then we've taken our eye off the ball a little bit. So my hope is that you've learned the humility that comes from working with really tough issues, how hard it is actually to um, make the world a better place, which feels like a cliche, but that's actually what I'm trying to do. And it's the simplest way to say it. Yes, it takes the knowledge, the skills that you've built, but it also takes a great deal of patience. It also takes a great deal of collaboration with other people and really getting to know the people that we're working alongside of and in service of. And that, that's my hope is that you, you glean some of that. You learn something deeply about the issues that you were um, dealing with and you connected with the people running the different organizations that you collaborated with as advisors and consultants. So to wrap it up, I, what you've done this summer is, is incredible. It, it's, it's huge. And I think that when you reflect on it in years to come, you'll be grateful for it. And I have mad respect for all of you and all of the work that you've done. And I, again, wish I could see your presentations. You have gained this summer a most valuable set of knowledge and skills that you will use for a lifetime, but you've also gained connections with people. All of the folks that you worked alongside of, your community colleagues, I encourage you to stay in touch with them. Stay in touch with them. You never know when you might be working again together in some other project somewhere around the world. And you'll say, hey, remember, Swanee, when we were together in the data lab and we were doing this and that? That's how it happens. There are relationships that I've had for a very long time that I treasure because the work that we do is super hard. So remember, finally, that in this space, it's not just about solving problems. But as social designers, as data scientists, I don't consider myself a data scientist, by the way, but you are, um, we actually cultivate opportunities to realize the promise and potential of all the communities that we work with in service of. So with that, I say congratulations to you all. Have an amazing rest of the summer. Uh, rest up because I guarantee you, you have a lot of great work ahead.
So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Karen, for setting us up perfectly for the next part, which is when we give you, I give you a brief um, introduction to Data Lab, um, who we are, what we do, and how we do it. So, Data Lab is a data science for social good summer fellowship hosted at Suwani. Um, as our students, fellows will tell you, uh, it's a competitive program and it's a very intensive program. Uh, we have 20 students from four universities. You heard the universities earlier. Uh, and we have staff from both industry and academia. Um, what we do is we partner with government organizations, with nonprofits, with other community partners to work on problems that really, really matter. Uh, when we're done, we open source our code and we make it available to everybody. So other organizations out there could at some point also benefit. So we scale beyond the specific partners that we work with. Um, we have um, three goals. Our first goal is to train aspiring data scientists from diverse backgrounds. Our second goal is to train our partners on how to work on data science problems. And um, our um, third goal is to make a dent, actually make a dent in one of those big problems for social good. Um, there is an academic component to Data Lab, but it's not a summer class, it's a full-time job. And uh, in fact, we run it a little bit like a startup. So yes, just like a startup, we're short on money and we're short on time. But what I, what I really mean uh, by that is um, we are all sort of co-owners of Data Lab. Uh, we all wear different hats. We all deal with a lot of uncertainty. We deal with all the messiness of reality, the messy data, the messy goals, the messy... Um, challenges that come up along the way. And despite that, we produce something good and so something um, actionable. Um, we have, we are competitive not only for our fellows, but we're competitive also for our partners. And uh, each summer we select the partners we're going to work with based on three criteria. So the first one is, are they working on something big and important that will lead to changes for social good. The second one is, do they have the data to do something about that problem that they're working with data science? And the third criteria is, will they be able to do something differently after we give them what we build this summer? And so we spend a lot of time carefully scoping projects for lots of months before data uh, lab actually gets started and then during the summer we implement it and then we deliver uh, to our partners um, so in addition to running like a startup we also run a bit like a consultancy and that's a very important point so we train our students and we train our partners how to look at data problems how to think about data science in a specific real world context. We train them to ask what questions to ask. That's one of the most important thing. What questions do you ask given the task, given the data, given the problem? We train them to apply data science responsibly and um, how to think about what it actually takes to deliver a project to somebody whose business it is to run that. So not, it's not an academic exercise of we got a data set, we did something with it, here are the results, right? Um, and finally, we help both our students and our partners figure out what it takes to be able to make good data-driven decisions because this is the ultimate goal. 
Um, this is the second year that Data Lab is happening. And the reason why it can happen again this year is because of the tremendous amount of love and effort um, that the organizers and students put in Data Lab last year, uh, led by Matthew Rudd. Over there in the back. <laughs> um, <laughs> As you already heard me uh, tell Nancy, because of the great support from the university, the ongoing support last year and this year, uh, the, if I may put a plug for ourselves here, the prestigious New America Foundation grant that we got to kick this off last year and to continue going this year. Um, and because of Ray Ghani, who connected us with that opportunity and who actually cracked the door open to all of this about 10 years ago with DSSG, the original DSSG at University of Chicago. Um, the reason we can do it for a second year is absolutely because of the fantastic staff we have this year. Uh, and it's no, no easy feat to put together a team like that. We've got uh, three bootcamp data science uh, instructors. We've got five technical mentors. We've got seven project mentors. Uh, and we've got two former uh, data lab students who did data lab last year and fell in love with data lab so much that they came back this year as my co-assistant directors. Mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't be here without our partners because they are the, the other half of, of what makes this work. So they put our trust in us, they prioritize these projects over other projects they could be doing, and they are the domain experts that are out there working on making that social good impact. And uh, we feel very honored that they sort of took us along the way with them um, and let us help them. Um, and <laughs> last but not least, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our wonderful, bright, very dedicated students who really pour their heart and their time and their energy into this. And they have learned a tremendous amount. They have produced a tremendous amount. Um, and I am very, um, very proud of them. And uh, I have great um, expectations for uh, wonderful things to still come in the future. Uh, some of them will end up being data scientists as their careers, uh, but some of them will end up being your judges and your doctors and your educators and your architects. So any, any job that you can think of, uh, we need more people in all the spheres of our lives that make um, ethical, responsible, data-driven decisions who can um, see the big problem, who know where the catches are, where to pay attention, where to, um, apply data science and where to not apply data science. Um, I am very proud of Data Lab in general for enabling this kind of training and this kind of impact. And uh, I am very proud um, of everybody, students, partners, mentors, everybody that I had mentioned. Um, there's a quote from Margaret Mead that I often, I can't tell you how often, I often come back to when I think about data lab and just general kind of data science efforts. And I wanted to leave you with it. Uh, I hope you like it and relate to it as much as I do. So never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I find this to be 100% true. And uh, this, is, this is what keeps me going. And I think this is what keeps all of us going. So um, now onto our lightning talks. And the first team is well-being. Hello, we are the well-being dream team. And we're cracking the code to student flourishing. I'm Michael. I'm Sam. I'm Tammy. 
and I'm Jarelli, and our partner for this project is the wonderful Dr. Nicole Nafsinger Frazier, the Associate Dean of Student Flourishing and Wellness. And our mentor is the amazing Dr. Sylvia Gray, uh, the Senior Director of Equity, Equal Opportunity, and Title IX. Okay. Does anyone here know what the leading cause of disability is worldwide? <laughs> These are all great answers, but I would like to inform everyone that the answer is depression. Depression, among other mental illnesses, are one of the several reasons why students may not be flourishing. So what is flourishing? Well, according to our partner, flourishing is the presence of positivity, it's connecting with others, it's having a mastery over one's environment, it's not a trait, it's a state or spectrum of well-being that we all have to work on daily. Today, college students are experiencing mental health crises at unprecedented rates. Poor mental health can make college life difficult and can create problems socializing, completing homework, and other daily activities. The university cares about the well-being of students and wants to figure out how to better understand and address problems here at Suwannee. This summer, the Office of Student Success and Flourishing has partnered with Swanee Data Lab to figure out who needs help and how we can help them. So we want to crack the code student flourishing. Where do we start? If only there was a way to figure out how 15 plus 100 students are thinking and feeling about their mental health and well-being. Enter Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds have provided us with survey data that records the prevalence of mental health outcomes, knowledge and attitudes about mental health, and mental health service utilization. Each year, students are invited to fill out the survey to give us a better idea of how they are thinking and feeling about their mental health and well-being. We have a rich data set with four years of data, approximately 1,400 respondents, and variables ranging on information from mental health status to sleep and exercise. So to start on this project, we brainstormed research questions with our partner. Then, because we had so much data, we had a process called data cleaning, where we got rid of any inconsistent or missing data and kept only the variables that were necessary and most relevant to our um, research questions. Next. We analyzed the data, we created the graphs, and built our own dashboard from scratch using one statistics software called R. And the user friendliness of this dashboard was of the utmost importance since uh, this is the first time information like this about Suwannee's student body is being made available to the public. So using our partner's definition of flourishing, we wanted to look at some trends and correlations of mental health and flourishing here on campus. To start with mental health, we found that 35% of Suwannee students have at least one diagnosed mental illness. When we looked further into this population, we found that over 50% of these students are members of the LGBTQ community. This is a huge issue here at Suwannee, but now let's talk on a more positive note. 63% of students here are flourishing. That means they reported being highly satisfied or satisfied with their lives. However, there is a huge discrepancy between genders within this population. To start, 0% of genderqueer and non-conforming students are highly satisfied with their lives. To give you a comparison, roughly 40% of male identifying students reported being highly satisfied with their lives. So what does this mean? Why does this matter? From these results, we can tell that more advocacy is needed for the mental health and flourishing of LGBTQ plus students. One way to do this is by adding more resources towards the programs that are already here at Swanee that help support these students. Some examples of those programs are the Queer and Ally House and the Berenwick Women's Center. Being the first of its kind here at Swanee, our dashboard will raise awareness and inform the public about the student mental health status for the first time. Our results can help our partner, Nicole, understand where resources need to be targeted. And finally, our research can kickstart future initiatives to encourage student flourishing, not only here at Swanee, but possibly other universities. This was just a glimpse of our key findings. Um, if you'd like to learn more, please see us at the library. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kennedy Clinton. I'm Ellie Davis. And I'm Jenna Lusk and we're the ER team. We're investigating ER overuse on the South Cumberland Plateau. 
We're doing this by analyzing hospital discharge data from 2019 from all of the hospitals in the state of Tennessee. We're doing this to better understand how residents from the South Cumberland Plateau are medically underserved. Now, before we begin, I'd like you to take a moment and think about your most recent visit to the ER. Did you wait in the waiting room way longer than you expected? Most likely. Did your bill come back higher than you anticipated? Probably. These are just few symptoms of ER overuse that affect us all. Concerns have grown in the most recent year regarding emergency room overuse in the United States. But especially in rural parts of the country where access to primary care and urgent care is often limited. Around 13 to 27% of ER visits are classified as ER overuse. ER overuse contributes to things like long waiting times, a depletion in resources, an increase in cost, and it limits the department's ability to fulfill their roles as emergency centers. Now, what do we mean by ER overuse? ER overuse is defined as using the emergency room for non-emergencies, such as a minor head injury or a cold. But it's also defined as using the emergency room for an ambulatory care sensitive condition. These are conditions in which hospitalization could have and can be prevented with primary outpatient care. To quantify ER overuse in our work, we made a comparison of appropriate visits and overuse visits. Overuse visits being defined as either the patient came in with the primary diagnosis of a non-emergency and or an, an ambulatory care sensitive condition. Our work this summer has been dedicated to understanding ER overuse right here on the South Cumberland Plateau. The plateau is made up of three different counties, Grundy, Franklin, and Marion, all of which are defined by the Health Resources and Services Administration as being medically underserved. What our partner, the South Cumberland Health Network, wants to understand is how. How are these communities being medically underserved? The South Cumberland Health Network is a nonprofit organization that works to remediate barriers to healthcare access among residents on the plateau. Our team has used data analysis to pinpoint trends in ER overuse that can help identify what some of these barriers to access are. So why look at ER overuse to achieve this? Well, ER overuse is typically a symptom of a much larger problem regarding inaccessibility of healthcare services within a community. By investigating ER overuse, we can identify where gaps may exist between community health needs and existing health services. So our partner will use our findings as well as questions generated by those findings to inform their advocacy um, to improve access to healthcare services on the plateau. A couple questions that came up in our data analysis were, do urgent care hours need to be expanded in the nearby area? Do primary care clinics need to expand services on the plateau? Or do additional primary and urgent care clinics need to be established? Our data analysis found that 40% of all ER visits from patients on the South Cumberland Plateau in 2019 were instances of overuse. This is double the national average. It is more than clear that ER overuse is a significant problem on the plateau. And it is also a good indicator that the current medical services do not meet the medical needs of the community. A deeper dive into the data shows that patients with government insurances, as well as those that are uninsured, use the ER to treat ACS conditions at a greater rate than those with commercial insurances. This is a map of the South Cumberland Plateau broken down by zip code. The dark blue indicates the least amount of overuse, while the dark red indicates the most. But even the darkest blue zip code on this map has over 35% of all ER visits being instances of overuse, which is still above the national average. Looking at the plateau as a whole, you can see that there is not a single red dot. That means that there is not a single urgent care on the South Cumberland Plateau. 
The blue markers indicate the top 10 most frequented hospitals by patients on the plateau. The, and astonishingly, the third most free, frequented hospital, this one in the top right corner, is a whopping 45 minutes away from the closest South Cumberland Plateau zip code. So it's clear that ER overuse is a severe issue on the South Cumberland Plateau. Our findings provide insight into what some of the barriers to healthcare access may be that exist in this community and can help to inform our partners' advocacy moving forward, which is aimed at closing some of the service gaps and breaking down barriers to access. If you'd like to talk more about this issue, please visit us at our table in the library. We'd love to chat with you. Thank you. Hello, we are the Swanee Wetlands Project. I'm Tessa. I'm Harrison. And I'm Lauren. Our project mentor was Professor of Mathematics at Swanee, Dr. Catherine Cavagnero, and our community partner is Professor of Biology at Swanee, Dr. Deborah McGrath. So when you flush your toilet at home, do you ever consider how your wastewater is treated? For many, it's treated through a municipal water treatment plant where a significant amount of land, labor, and money are used in the process. But here in Swanee, at our local utility district, they're working with constructed wetlands for wastewater treatment. Constructed wetlands are a much more sustainable and cost-effective method of wastewater treatment. Through microbial activity and aquatic plants, wetlands can naturally filter out the contaminants and pollutants that come along with wastewater. We know that wetland treatment has worked successfully on a large scale, such as the systems in Clayton County, Georgia, and Orange County, California. However, no research has been conducted on the effectiveness of wetland treatment on a small rural scale like Swanee. So, in 2016, our community partner, Dr. McGrath, lobbied for the construction of three wetland basins at the Swanee Utility District in order to determine whether or not wetlands are an effective method of treatment for a small community setting like ours. Here's our current system where wastewater undergoes a tertiary treatment, beginning with the primary treatment at Bob Stuman Road, where all heavy solids are filtered out through a screen and moving on to the secondary biological treatment where the water either goes into Lagoon A or Lagoon B, eventually moving on into Lagoon C. Typically, after the Lagoon C treatment, water is disinfected with chlorine and sprayed onto a vast forested area known as the spray fields. However, now that we, uh, they've implemented the experimental tertiary treatment, water moves from Lagoon C into the three wetland basins and back into Lagoon C. There are two probes, one in Lagoon C and one in Wetland Basin 3, where water quality measurements are taken hourly. This is to compare the two treatment sites against each other. Here is Lagoon C, and this is duckweed on top. Here is the water supply tank, which controls how much water flows from Lagoon C into the first wetland basin. And here's one of our spray fields. So our partner came to us with approximately 14 months of data, ranging from the end of 2020 all the way through the end of 2021. While she had an idea of how the wetlands were doing just based off of these data points alone, uh, she had no real way to visual the data as a whole, and also nothing like this was available to the community. So with that in mind, we were tasked with creating an interactive dashboard. Um, and one of the tabs that you can see behind us is dedicated to water quality comparison. This comparison is done by using color coding based on whether or not a variable meets EPA standards. If a variable meets the EPA standards, it's color coded as blue and shows up as blue on the graph. Um, if the variable does not meet standards, then it's color coded as green. An example of this that you can see behind me is pH. If pH is between 6.5 and 9, then it will show up as blue. If it's outside of that, then it will show up as green. Uh, another one of our tabs is dedicated to trends that you can see within the data. Uh, we went about this by separating the trends into different time frames. So you can look at them in monthly, daily, and hourly. 
Another one of our tabs is dedicated to uh, weather data. Weather data is really important when you're analyzing how well the wetland is doing because it can have a large impact on that. So one issue that we've encountered with the wetlands is dissolved oxygen. Because the wetlands are so small, invasive species have taken over and we don't have the labor to maintain that. As a result, dissolved oxygen levels have decreased. This is a problem because low dissolved oxygen levels can harm aquatic life and kill fish species. If we eventually want to discharge the water from the wetlands back into the streams, then we need to get our oxygen levels on par with EPA standards. Our partner has already installed an aerator to add oxygen to the wetlands. This graph here shows monthly variables pre-aeration and will allow our partner to continue to input data to see water quality variables post aeration. Our goal is to see if the wetlands can continue or if the wetlands can flow directly into streams rather than be sprayed onto the spray fields. The spray field method requires lots of land, which isn't cheap and changes the forest environment. Our dashboard's goal is to educate the public on the well-being of the wetlands, as well as to help our partner continue to see wetlands changes. Our data will also be open sourced so that the next group of wetlanders can continue to see wetlands changes, as well as to see how to implement wetlands on a small rural scale. You can visit our table and the library to, to learn more about the future of the wetlands. The wetlands are a solid number two, but we are hoping we can make it a number one for wastewater treatment. Thank you. everyone. My name is Monet Scott, and these are my partners, Hallie Rutten and Shelby Klein. Today, we're going to be telling you why bats play a vital role in our ecosystem. Before we start, I want to ask the crowd a few questions. Who in here likes bananas? Oh, good number. Who in here likes chocolate? Oh, even more people. Mangoes? Okay. How about tequila? Yeah. If you raise your hand for any of those questions, you're gonna to wanna to pay very close attention to this presentation. Bats serve as seed dispersers, pest control, and pollinators for everything you raise your hand for, including agave plants that tequila is produced from. <laughs> and I wanna ask you one more question. Who in here likes mosquitoes? Nobody. <laughs> so we can thank bats for eating up to 1.5 million mosquitoes per month saving the U.S. $3.7 billion in ecosystem services per year. Sadly, over the past two decades, millions of bats have died due to a fungal disease called white-nose syndrome, some species even experiencing a 90% decline. Sewanee, with its 13,000 acres consisting of forests and caves, serves as the perfect place for bats to live. Our partner, Dr. Amy Turner with her organization, the Sewanee Bat Study, has been collecting data since 2017 to try and gauge where the current bat population stands here in Sewanee. They're also interested in how different land management practices affect bat activity. The three main areas of focus are manage, unmanage, and coves. A, un, a managed area has undergone some, type of, some kind of alteration such as a prescribed burn or logging, Unmanaged indicates that the land has little to no alteration and coves consist of the valleys and creek beds along the Cumberland Plateau. Over the past six years, the Sewanee Bat Study has placed acoustic sensors across the domain to try and detect and monitor bat activity. These recordings are then run through a program called Kaleidoscope, which sorts each audio file as either a bat sound or noise and then identifies the species. What we are then left with is a very rich data set consisting of 4 million observations. And yet, until this summer, there was no way to visualize this wealth of data from Sewanee. That's where Data Lab comes in. Our team has worked. 
to analyze years of this sensor data so that Dr. Turner and her team can make data-driven decisions regarding three main goals. Number one, identifying which compartments or areas as seen on this map are crucial for bats. Number two, what land management practices might be harmful or helpful. And three, what species seem to be thriving or not. We accomplish this, in short, by searching for trends in bat uh, activity across management areas and time, then placing these results in an interactive dashboard. But that is way easier said than done. At the start of the summer, we were handed the aforementioned 500 spreadsheets and told to whittle them down into one workable data set in the statistics program R. But after we had that starting point, we divided and conquered, and we dove into an exploratory analysis from which we derived the, our outline of our dashboard. This dashboard ended up with six categories. Number one, long-term, which consents of, uh, consists of trends by year. Number two, seasonal by month of the year. Number three, circadian by hour of the day. Four, diversity by species proportions. Five, spatial within each compartment. And six, sampling effort, which details monitoring devices and uh, sensor accuracy. About halfway through our project, we realized that we needed to account for sampling uh, accuracy in our calculations. We adjusted them so that each year's data was proportional to one another. Uh, from there, it was smooth sailing, and we were able to assemble our final product. The results we found were just about as expected, yet at the same time, interesting. Bad activity has been on a slow and steady decline across the years. Not much of a surprise. There may be some variation year to year or species to species, but the overall trend is down. However, if you break it out by management type, you see some unique trends. Clearly, managed areas show significantly more activity than the other two. And if you look even closer, you can see that for both cove and unmanaged areas, they show high activity in 2018, followed by a plunge in 2019, while managed areas show the inverse, a plunge followed by a resurgence. As our dashboard is meant to be an exploratory tool, we have not yet determined exactly why this occurs, but this is just one example of all the exciting future research questions that can be generated by this dashboard. <laughs> the displays also show us the change in relative species proportions across the years. For example, big brown bats up there in maroon are a, cave, a seasonal cave dwelling species that has been affected by white nose have been decreasing in activity, while silver haired bats, a forest dwelling species up there in blue gray, have been increasing in activity. This is another trend that opens the possibility for future investigation. To ensure that our dashboard remains useful, even after this summer, we have created an intake system that will add new data as it's collected so our dashboard can show any changes that may occur in the future. This pro project will provide the basis for ongoing research and allow Dr. Turner and her team to make data-informed forest management decisions for Swanee's future. All our findings will also be made available online so to the general public, so in the hopes that this dashboard can be a tool for education and exploration for all. If you have any questions or would like to explore our dashboard and learn more, feel free to fly by our table in the library after these talks. Catch you later. Hello and good evening. My name is Jacob Heron. I'm here with my partners, Alon Espinoza and Delana Turner, and we're here to share our work on the In the Syndemic project. But first, what is a syndemic? A syndemic is two or more concurrent epidemics connected through biological factors. Within Tennessee, our syndemic is made up of multiple syringe-related epidemics connected through syringe-related substance use. Would you kindly raise your hand if you've ever paid taxes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you raised your hand, this is something that affects you directly. Every year, the syndemic costs hundreds of young lives and millions of your dollars in public funds. Diagnoses like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, sepsis, and many other skin, soft tissue, and venous infections are exacerbated through syringe-related substance use. In 2019, Tennessee hospitals reported that 4% of all cases were for these diagnoses. For the substance use population, these diagnoses were seen in 12% of all cases. 
To put it simply, you are three times more likely to suffer from one of these costly, deadly illnesses as someone in the substance use population than someone in the aggregate. Now, to the left, we have a graph of the total population. And as we can see, we can see a steady increase of your likelihood of having one of these infections as your age increases. Now to the right, we have a graph of the substance use population. And in here, we can see a bell shaped and we can see a difference in the age range from 25 to 44. Now, if we were to compare, we can see that clearly the graph to your right is larger than to the left, the highlighted bars, but not just larger, but 20% larger. These are people who are living through their primary prime ages of their lives and are the same people who run our state day by day and those are the people that are mostly affected by this. These cases are not cheap either. In 2019, over half a billion dollars was spent on treating cases of this endemic and over half of that, which is $326 million, came from public funds. Even worse, about 3% of all syndemic cases end in death. As of right now, hundreds of young lives are being lost and millions of your dollars are being spent on something that is preventable. This is preventable. For the past few years, our partner within the Tennessee Department of Health and the CDC, Ms. Amber Coyne, has spearheaded an initiative to end the syndemic. One solution they've come across are syringe service programs. Syringe service programs have been proven time and time again to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, to link people to recovery services, are cost saving, and do not increase illegal drug use or crime. Despite this, these programs are still not popular due to years of built up prejudices and fear mongering. If you care about your community, or even just your wallet, then you care about these programs. If you'd like to learn more, please stop by our table in the library following the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. That is good. Okay, I want everyone to think back to a time when you stumbled across a financial emergency. Maybe you were able to turn to your savings to cover this expense. Maybe you were fortunate enough to have family or friends offer help. Or maybe you were desperate and stressed, in need of quick cash now. Well, 56% of Americans are unable to cover an unexpected bill of $1,000 with savings. From these individuals, minorities, Elderly, low-income households, and individuals with poor credit scores often turn to payday and title loan companies for quick cash. These predatory lenders often charge an interest of up to 460%, leaving these vulnerable and low-income households stuck in a cycle of debt. This summer, we've partnered up with BetterFi. BetterFi is an economic justice nonprofit that's local in Tennessee that aims to help these low-income households escape debt by offering low-interest loans. Referencing this visual behind me, if you were to take out $500 from a predatory lender, you would end up paying three to five times more than if you went to BetterFi. Looking at these red, orange, and blue boxes, they each represent $10 that go only to interest and fees. BetterFi is the best alternative. So BetterFi's current method of assessing applicants is very time consuming. The team gets together and looks at every client and decides on a case-to-case -case basis, which results in a bottleneck of loans being approved. So BetterFi wants a quick and data-driven method to supplement their current decision method so that they're able to give out more loans to more people who are in need of their help. To address this problem, our team has created a risk assessment tool that predicts the probability of a client repaying a loan. To do this, we looked at multiple modeling techniques and we tested and compared these techniques until we found the right model that was the most explainable and the most accurate. Our, our final model is a decision tree model that intakes client information and based on historical data, predicts the probability of them either paying back the loan or defaulting. 
we then we then integrated this model onto a dashboard that only Betterfy has access to. Here, Betterfy can input client information and predict the probability of them paying back a loan all with the click of a button. Our final model's current accuracy is at 84%, which is comparable to Betterfy's current accuracy as well. However, our model can make predictions instantly, allowing Betterfy to use it as a tool to get uh, to give more loans and to scale their operations. Other than the model, we also wanted to help Betterfy get better insights from their data. And to do this, we added data visualizations to the internal dashboard as well. Here, Betterfy can select a category and a variable and get relevant data visualizations related to that uh, variable. For example, here's a graph that shows the monthly income and expenses for Betterfy's clients. Graphs like these will help Betterfy get better insights, learn and interact with their data, just so they can make better data-driven business decisions. We also will provide Betterfy with methods to improve and standardize future data collection through data quality guidelines that focus on accuracy and consistency. We not only wanted to help Betterfy, but also provide resources for the community. In doing so, we created a map that shows potential predatory lending locations in our area. It also reveals just how high these annual percentage rates are, as well as median income and population of each county. With these products, Betterfy will be able to scale their business in order to give out more loans, expand into the communities that need their help the most, spread awareness about the harms of predatory lending, and help and inspire other nonprofits and community members to uplift their own community and join the fight to end predatory lending. Thank you so much, and come visit our table after this. It's crazy to me how quickly that we can get statistics at our fingertips about anything. For example, are there any basketball fans in the room? Okay, so we have a couple. Let's see how quick Siri can give us a quick statistic. Hey Siri, show me LeBron James' statistics from 2020. LeBron James was a small forward for the Lakers in 2020. Okay, so he's not that small, but she was right on almost everything because I have a whole sheet of statistics pulled up. I can break down his three-point percentage, his free throw percentage, how many three-pointers he made in one season that quickly. How long was that? A second? Well, let's ask her another question. Hey, Siri, what's the most endangered cave species in the United States? Hmm. I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? Uh, okay. Um, so she doesn't have the answer to that, but I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt because currently nobody has synthesized the available data on endangered cave species in the last 20 years. And that's what we've been working to do this summer with my partner, Dr. Ziegler, who is somewhere in here. There he's waving in the back. He's a professor of biology here at the university and also has a special interest in the biodiversity of cave species all across Northern America. And how are we going to start with this? Where do we begin? Well, first we need data, and that's where NatureServe comes in. Fortunately enough, Dr. Ziegler was able to contact NatureServe, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing updated information on conserving all species, not just cave species. And we were fortunate enough to be able to take this data and put it into a data set that I like to call the caves data. And this is full of different information, such as the cave species, its common name, where it's most commonly found, and taxonomy, which is a chart that you can see on the right. If you're not familiar with taxonomy, this can basically be the scientific version of naming something. And you can see that chart here on the right, breaking down from domain all the way to species. And along with that, we have other important factors to consider, like global status. And when I say global status, Think about it in a way of ranking a species of how endangered it truly is. And what we're focusing on specifically is G1 through G3. 
species that fall within this category pose a high risk of extinction or elimination in the near future, which is what we are focused on. Now, we do include GX, GH, and G4 and 5, but as you're about to see, the majority of our data falls within G1 through 5. One of the first things we are interested in doing is comparing how these cave species compare to all other species that are available in NatureServe. And what we're going to show you here is those comparisons. On the left, you'll see all species in NatureServe minus the cave species. Looking specifically at the red, orange, and yellow parts of the pie chart, this represents 30% of all species in NatureServe. And these are at risk of what we've labeled G1, G2, and G3. Now let's look at the caves data. Out of the cave species that we collected from NatureServe, G1 through G5, 94% of them fall within this range of G1 to G3. The comparison is incredible between the two, and this has been ignored for very long, as I've mentioned that it has not been synthesized in over 20 years. So let's look at it from another point. This is a bar chart of all of our data together. And it's here you'll see we have 716 species falling within critically imperiled, with the next after that being presumed extinct or possibly extinct. This is a large issue at hand, but it's in no way able to be solved just by analyzing data. Our hopes for the future in this is using what we have analyzed in the visualizations to be put forth into an academic paper that Dr. Ziegler and I will write and hopefully publish later on. What we hope to include are images like the next one you are about to see, which takes all 716 critically imperiled species and shows us what that looks like across the United States. You can easily see that areas like Texas, Tennessee, and Virginia all at least have 80 different species in each state that are critically impaired, imperiled. This is the issue alone, and we hope that the work that we have done this summer will continue to push forward in the scientific community, highlighting the regions and different species that are most at risk, in hopes that in the future this could be prevented. If you, oddly enough, have a favorite cave spider or something like that, I can show you how it's doing in the library if you stop by my table. So, thank you. Thank you. So, what do you guys think? Did you like the lightning talks? <laughs> Amazing, if I say so myself. <laughs> but this is only half of what I've got to show you. Uh, you heard the story, but then in a little bit, you're actually going to get to a chance to play with all the dashboards because we have setups there where you can have the, the teams will walk you through uh, what they've built. It's interactive. You can discover your favorite cave spider or you can look more at ER overuse. Um, so think, think of the questions you have and bring them to us um, for the reception. Um, before we ra wrap up, we have uh, one more um one more person that we'd like to uh, bring here in front of you, and uh, it's one of our partners. This is the company Betterfy that you heard about a little bit earlier, uh, and our partner is uh, Spike. Spike Hodge. Welcome. Thanks. Can we get uh, one more round of applause for all the data scientists? Yeah. Awesome stuff. Way to go. Yeah. I'm Spike Hosh. I'm the director and founder of Betterfy. And so um, obviously, I'm not the only partner here, but I really want to say on behalf of the partners, this is an awesome opportunity, awesome program. The work that they all did was really great. Um, and some of the partners might have, you know, if you're working with a professor or something like that, some resources to do this kind of analysis, but a lot of us don't. And so as, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, um, in rural areas, there's no resources or lack of resources. The resources we have are often really far away. They might be in Chattanooga or Nashville. And whether it's talking about hospitals and healthcare or access to affordable finance, but also access to data scientists. And so if it weren't for the data scientists here, for Data Lab, for the university, none of this stuff would happen. And not only did they do it all, but they made it really easy on the side of the partners. So again, thank you to that because 
we did nothing except provide the data. They cleaned it. They talked to us. They did their job as consultants, really, in coming and working with us to figure out what we needed and how best to go about getting that. Um, I'm also really appreciative, not just for the output of this project, for the tool that we will use, but also for the fact that because Data Lab is here, it's the start of a relationship. So this is the first of many ongoing things. I'm sure the other partners and professors will continue to work with their students on the things that they have been working on so far. Um, let's see, I'm looking at my notes here real quick. One thing I think is really neat about this, besides the fact that it exists, is that um, a lot of times, I don't know what the case is for the other partners, but we compete with actual for-profit companies. And so um, the people that we compete with are predatory lenders. They probably do some data analysis, but also they charge so much that they don't even need to. So a lot of the research that's being done, even though it's a really small you know, set of data, a really small place, is really novel things, right? So whether it's cave spiders and bats or you know, hospitals on the South Korean Plateau or predatory lenders and you know, how we can do that better, this is new stuff that will help us be better. Um, it's a tool that we can deploy right away to help assist us in the decisions we're making, but also be able to build upon it and do hopefully what Elena was saying, put a dent into some of these issues. So they're not doing any of the research themselves, you know, at the predatory lenders, the, ca the cash expresses, the title maxes. But if we do that, we can grow, we can poach off their best clients, we can put a dent in them. And the whole time the students are getting, you know, useful skills, the kind of things that KP was talking about earlier. Um, that's basically what I have to say. It's been a really great program. We're really appreciative and we're glad to see it continue. And, uh, Thank you, Elena, Jim, university, data scientists, everybody. So thanks. Thank you so much, Spike. Hello, everyone. My name is Feza, and this is Nika. She and I are the co-direct, co-assistant directors of Swanee Data Lab. We were so honored to work closely with our amazing 20 interns that you just saw. And to be honest, I am so, so, so impressed. I've seen this many times, but I keep getting impressed every day. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you here for being part of this and coming to support them. This is such a great privilege for all of us to see that y'all are willing to spare your time and come watch these terrific projects. This could not have all been done had it not been for the amazing work by our instructors who introduced them to R, for those who didn't know, walked them through it, and then our technical mentors who were there to answer questions that they had, our project mentors who were available to give them advice, uh, their feedback, and of course, our partners who gave us questions. I mean, what could we have worked with? So thank you so much. This is amazing, and it gets me to wonder, what could they have done in more than eight weeks? Impressive. Our interns, you all have grown and learned so much in the past eight weeks. From the countless hours you have spent learning R in code, to working with individuals that you met just a mere eight weeks ago, you are nothing short of phenomenal. We have thrown so many curveballs at you this summer, but we are incredibly proud of everything that you have done. Wherever you go in the world, wherever life takes you, I know you're going to do amazing because when you set a goal in front of you, yourselves, you accomplish it. So thank you. Now I'm going to ask quite a few people to stand. So if you can hold your applause but we would like our lovely interns to stand, our amazing technical mentors, wherever you may be, our technical instructors, who some are remote right now, our project mentors, yes, we see you, our one, our, uh, so sorry, our administrative supporters who are here with us, who Jim and Scott, thank you, as well as our one and only director, Elena Enaba. Thank you all so much for making this such a successful summer, and we are so proud of you all, and we appreciate everything you've done. So, thank you. <laughs> and
and also our community partners, of course, we love you all as well. <laughs> but if you are at all interested in becoming a part of this lovely team that you have just seen before you, we are accepting applications. So if you would like to be involved, please send us an email, come talk to us, and the application link will be live quite shortly. Yes, ma'am. For everyone who is interested in getting to interact closely, asking questions to the 20 interns that just presented, this is your chance. Come with us to the DuPont Library first floor. You will interact with all the dashboards, you ask questions, you receive answers, and you will also get to have some pizzas and some drinks. So please join us. Thank you so much. Woo!